Hello and welcome to Edukimi's YouTube channel. My name is Harsh Singh and in this video we shall discuss current affairs and gazette for today, 3rd of February 2022. Before we begin this discussion, let me welcome all of you here participating in the conversation. Hi Amlim Kriti, good evening. Hello Hima. Hi Babani, good evening Netra. Hello Ravi. Thanks for attempting this question, a tough one. Hi Somik, good evening Ashish. And then we have other people joining in, uh, Mithun, Somik, uh, Pooja, good evening. You have not found the PDF for today, all right. It might get be getting uploaded right now. And other people joining in right now and people joining later. Good evening to all of you and welcome to Etikami's YouTube channel. Today we continue the discussion on budget, things related to it and also certain important things that are in the news today itself. So uh, let's start this conversation and yes, the question for today, everybody viewing the video offline must look at the question today. It was a little tricky question and we will discuss the answer to this question in detail in uh, the featured news. And yes, some of you have caught the nerve of the question, but I will discuss what the issues are specifically related to the question and uh, how you have tried to answer what could be the amendment to it. And yes. Uh, uh, honestly speaking, uh, this was a little challenging one, but then this will be something that will help you exercise your mind very well, right? So we begin this conversation and we will uh, come to this question in the featured use. I will explain you the components of this question will help you decipher government programs, the philosophy of those programs and how the government is balancing the money and the long term strategy for the same, right? Agility approach. So let's begin this conversation. All right. Okay. So uh, say a yes and then I begin the conversation for today. Interesting articles to cover for today. Let's begin this. All right, what do we have in the Gazette today? Today we have certain uh, really interesting articles for you. The explanation of the budget itself, those components of the budget, how it is presented in the parliament and uh, various segments of the same. The second one is bonus stripping, something related to budget, an important uh, component of the market as well, the money market. And the third one is data centers, also spoken of in the budget, but how are they related to India's economy, climate change? We will understand all these three in the new snapshot section. This day in history dedicated to the first electric train, EMU, that ran in the country. Feature news for today on uh, the theme that you people, some of you had asked, the barbell strategy, please explain in details. Not only is the explanation in detail required, but also some components is what you know uh, must be served, especially the question that I had asked of you, right? So we will understand that. Image of the day on some inscriptions of the uh, 9th century times by the Pandya Kings Telangana region, right? Terms and concepts, Buddha, Buddha Vanam project near, uh, in Telangana, near the uh, Hussein Sagar, uh, the other, other, other dam, Hussein Sagar and uh, there's another dam near, uh, on the river Krishna where we have Buddhist artifacts. So we will have this project which is started working now. Chiru, what is this Chiru? Which country does it relate to? Please mention here, which are the three countries it relates to Chiru? And Indian Economic Service and News, why? Because we don't have it till now. We will understand what is the requirement. And brain mimicking chip, ethical issue, yet uh, something that has been proposed. The two editorials that we have for today are one, elementary education architecture in the country. And the second one on artificial intelligence technologies, which have a climate cost. The case study is on Roti Bank, trying to help people having uh, two square meals for the day during these corona pandemic times, right? All right, let's begin this conversation. Very interesting today. So uh, the first snapshot is on, the, is on the budget itself. What is the course of uh, creation of this budget and how does it get proceeded in the parliament? It is, budget is just the proposal for expenditure for the forthcoming year. It also reflects the uh, revised estimate and the quick estimate of the last year and the actuals of the last to last year, right? So uh, this is what it contains, four important components. And then it also has uh, places for uh, this that we had explained yesterday. What I had explained to you verbally is what we have put in the complete explanation, uh, you know, theme wise here. 
So budget, we have two accounts, revenue and capital account. In revenue account, there are receipts and expenditure. In capital account, there are receipts and expenditure. So what usually gets asked in questions in prelim exam is what are the revenue receipts and what are the uh, revenue expenditures? They will ask if payment of salary is a revenue expenditure or capital expenditure. So they will uh, they will put three or four you know topics here and they will they will ask which of them is revenue expenditure or which of them is capital earnings right so this this particular diagram will help you sort it not only this diagram in general also you must know what are the revenue receipts what are the capital receipts we had discussed each of them uh, yesterday but here is a segregation quick segregation of this now there are other components of the budget in which the government speaks of a uh, few important parameters for example what is the revenue deficit what is the fiscal deficit what is the active revenue deficit and uh, what is the primary deficit right these four are very important parameters for us to understand where the finances of the government is actually going it is leading in the future times in the present times so these are the four important parameters through which we understand what the government actually wants to do and the government had uh, the passed a bill called as Fiscal Responsibility and Budgetary Management Act 2003. According to this, according to this act, the government said that we will try, this was passed in the parliament and the main contention here was to have a fiscal discipline. The idea was to reduce the revenue deficit to 0% and fiscal deficit to 3%. Along with that, the government will have a, a debt net debt of 60% not more than that effective total debt central government debt at 40% of the GDP and state governments 20% so no, total debt 60% this is these three important components have to be maintained through the fiscal responsibility and budgetary management act yesterday and day before you people had asked me a question what will happen to this consolidation fiscal consolidation if, if we have this kind of uh, budgeting in this case, there will be further amendments right, to this act. This act was amended in 2008, it was amended in 2019, it will get amended again. right? So, uh, in understanding what this budget is about, we have to understand what is the revenue expenditure, what is the, uh, what is the revenue earning of the government, what is the fiscal uh, deficit for the government, that means the borrowing and interest payment. Each of this we had discussed yesterday. In case you have some doubts, Feel free to ask. We will discuss that quickly. Some of you will be able to revise it. In case no, we will actually proceed into this article. Right? So, this article overall explains the same components that I had mentioned. Expenditure, revenue and receipts, revenue and then capital expenditure. Now, but since if you have doubts, please put a yes, I have a doubt. I will I'll explain this. Otherwise, we will go ahead with the, uh, the other contents of this particular article. All right, Netra, Amblan, absolutely, China, Russia, and uh, uh, and Iran. So this is a triad getting formed, a triad of countries. These three countries will be called as a minilateral, right? Military minilateral, which are conducting an exercise for themselves. Nagarjun Sagar, thank you, Hima. Yeah, absolutely, good. Nagarjun Sagar. So Ravi says, the budget is, con is continuation of previous year's budget, but does not talk about the achievements of previous commitments, long-term goals. But what about the current catastrophe-like situation? All right. Somek says FRBM 2003 fiscal deficit should not exceed 3.5% of GDP. Is it 3.5 or 3? Uh, hi. Hi, Kim. Hi. Good evening. All right. So, uh, one thing primarily to understand is that our, uh, our deficit, the total, not fiscal deficit, but the total debt of the government, it's shot up. It shot up just because of the Corona pandemic. And this image is rightly indicative of the same, right? So the total debt of the central government here, only central government was at 51% of uh, the GDP. And it was going below and it would have actually met what was promised in the FRBM Act. But, but it shot up from 51%, right? right to 58% later. So this is around central government 60% and state's uh, total debt is around 30%. This is around 90%. Adding it all is 90% of uh, the GDP. This is what is the debt of the government and uh, central and state governments included. I will compare this with what is happening around the world. But we should understand what is the situation of India and how are we trying to cope up with a thing like this. Right? So uh, when you look at what I have in this image, 
is the uh, the FRBM Act, which mentions the uh, three stacks, sixty percent, zero, and three percent, and then uh, debt to GDP. You, I hope that you understand the difference between debt and deficit. Def so it it might be confusing, but deficit is only for the budgetary year, right? If I am not able to handle my expenses, I will take some loans, borrowings. And this borrowings are the deficit, but this is only for that specific year. What about the borrowings which I have had, which I have taken years back? Borrowings, not only cash borrowings, but also bonds, right? Long term bonds, which I sold in the international market or, or domestic market. So they are a part of the debt, right? So deficit right now is what? 6.9% of the GDP, right? This is what the government says. And next year it will have it as 6.4 percent. All right, great. But if you look at the debt, the total debt of the central and state governments, this is around 90 percent of the GDP, accounted for years and years to come, right? And this should, this was actually around 65 percent before Corona pandemic, 65 to 70 percent. But because of the pandemic, we had to start spending more money, and this is what it resulted into. So you would ask, how do the, how do we start taking loans? There are internal loans and external loans. Right now, see, these are the things that you have to be putting in answers. These are the facts that we speak of. For example, debt to GDP ratio. That's what I'm explaining here right now. Then the second one would be deficit. Deficit to GDP. What all deficit? Fiscal deficit, revenue deficit, effective revenue deficit and uh, primary deficit. And the third one could be tax to GDP ratio. These are three, four very, very important parameters that one must uh, understand and also the external debt. Why is this important? We'll just discuss. See, uh, if we take debt, if we take, if the debt to GDP is 90%, we must know what is the amount of debt that we have taken from inside the country and what is the amount that we have taken from outside the country. If we have taken more money from outside, that means we are not sovereign. We are not self-governing, we are not supreme inside or independent outside. Anybody from outside who has the bond can force us to pay the money back, right? So, the that, this is the best part about India that our external debt is not very high. External debt is around 20%. On the other hand, internal debt is what drives us, right? So, this is one good thing. Uh, tax to GDP ratio is around 10% for us, 10 to 11%. This is the situation in India few taxpayers but uh, bearing the burden of all the collection around 25 lakh uh, crore correction for the government right so internal debt is raised through through treasury bills short term treasury bills bonds securities external debt through multilateral institution loans right so this is how we are able to finance our uh, debts right what had the 15th finance commission the chairman of the commission can anybody name the chairman of the 15th finance commission the chairman of the commission had stated that a slow and gradual decline in certain government and general government debt 50 to 56 and 85 percent respectively by financial year 2026 so they said all right you know these are the people chairman of the finance commission is the person who is head of a, 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 a review committee of frbm act so this gentleman mr nk singh he is an IS officer. He, he is the chairman of 15 Finance Commission. He is the one who is also the head of the review committee of FRBM Act, if the government is following the fiscal strategies or not. He has said, uh, what, what to do? If we are spending more, what to do? So what we'll do is, we will have slow and steady progress towards reducing the government's debt. This is what they have said clearly, right? Ideally, the debt to GDP ratio of the central to be brought to 40% and states 20% by 2024-25. This was the previous strategy before Corona pandemic, 40 and 60, 40 and 20, that means 60%, but you can see it is total 90%. So these four data you must remember, debt to GDP, uh, deficit to GDP, tax to GDP, and uh, the fourth one, internal or external debt. Would you like to compare this with other countries? Oh, why not? We must know this. So, while India's debt to GDP ratio is the one in green, you see this, right? So, 1950s to 2015, please be patient, let me analyze this. So, this is almost static, almost static, around 25% of GDP to around 50% of GDP. This is where we are, right? Uh, up to 2015. 
right? But if you look at how it is for Japan, it has shot up like anything. See, 200% of Japan's GDP is its debt. And for USA, it has hovered from 100 to around 100 again, right? Around 75 to around 100 again. This is the uh, debt to GDP ratio of the country. This is pre-pandemic. Please remember this. This is what I could gain, gain. So what I want to say through this is that a country, developing country like India must have uh, ideally 40 to 50 percent of debt for a developing country. But for an advanced country, they have these kind of debt, you know, they have social obligations, they expend more, they take more loans, but their loan paying ability is also high. Their credibility is also high. This is the reason that people still give them more loans. But in case of European economy, some of them, for example, pigs economy, Portugal, Greece, uh, this is Spain and then Italy. And we also had some more inclusions in pigs economy. Their loan paying capacity was low, credibility became low and their debt to GDP became very high. This led to a crisis in Europe post the 2008 crisis in USA. So uh, the financial bubble, financial bubble was actually, it, you know, it initiated in USA. But when it went on to Europe, when it translated to Europe, it translated to these kind of issues of uh, debt to uh, GDP ratio as well in advanced economies. Largely, they are more credible and that is why they can get more loans. But for a country like India, if we take more loans and we do not have the paying capacity, just like Sri Lanka doesn't have the paying capacity, our, our uh, credibility will be downgraded by S&P Global. It will be downgraded by Fitch. It will be downgraded by other international rating institutions. Right now, we have got a very good Forex reserve. We have got a stable in uh, currency, external currency and uh, so uh, rupee to dollar uh, exchange rate, largely stable. Yeah, so uh, there are some factors on the basis of which we are uh, getting decent amount of loans, right? If you look at uh, uh, gross debt uh, of India, so uh, this is of the year 2021, 83%. China 70% 70, 70 of debt to GDP, Indonesia 43 but if you see UK, one USA 132%, UK 110 and Germany around 90%, uh, 70%, 70 for an advanced economy to maintain such a good uh, debt to GDP ratio is a very good thing. See, taking debt is not a problem but utilizing that debt for capital investment, right, not, not, not giving them fish but teaching them how to fish, this is important, right. So, uh, if we can get capital goods, see, uh, if I was to take loan, if I was to take loan for myself, I would take loan to prepare a setup like this for myself, right? Rather than taking loan to, uh, you know, break my bread every day, eat chapatis or eat kulchas every day, uh, you know, so 50 rupees kulcha for myself, I would rather go and take this uh, gadget for myself. I'll get it imported from China or Vietnam and I'd say that through this I'll be able to teach, I'll be able to earn revenue. Is it not true? Similarly, when countries like developing countries start making loans, they must take more loans for capital in, capital development in the industry. So import capital goods, don't import the high-end cars, the cars which have been manufactured in Japan and China. Import capital goods through which we are able to create these cars in India, right? import that technology or those human resources which are able to give us the chip design. Don't have the chips imported in our country at high tax rates. You understand this? This is why countries like developing countries should be taking loan, right? So uh, you should look at this. I've taken this from moneycontrol.com. Last year, India's debt was around 147 lakh crore, 2021 beginning. India's debt was around 147 lakh crore against year's estimated GDP of 194 lakh crore, right? So around 70%, right? This year, the government plans to borrow another 12 lakh crore, 2021. Point I'm saying is this borrowing, this borrowing is the uh, deficit. Deficit. And this is the debt, right? So I hope that this is clear that both the terms are very much different. You should know uh, how many people are investing so that we are able to earn this much. All right. 
So quick understanding about Corona. We have spent decently on Corona. This percentage of GDP is what we have spent on Corona. And so has China. Very similar percentage. But Brazil and Thailand have spent a lot of uh, money on Corona uh, fighting. Right. This is the percentage of GDP that we are talking of. Right. Source is IMF. But the one thing that is good about India's uh, debt is that all the debt is not in dollars. Even if we have to pay back internationally, we can pay this back in our own currency. So our currency also is good. See, many countries might not have dollar now. Sri Lanka doesn't have dollars to pay in. So currency swapping is happening. Similarly, India can pay decent amount of money in loans also in, in rupees. So you see the blue, the dark, uh, uh, this upper part, the one in blue, the upper part is in rupees. The lower part is in dollars and other foreign debt is in the middle range. This has only increased with time. We can pay back in, if we don't have dollars, we can pay it back in Indian rupee also. So gains more credibility in international space. This is a good part about the external loans that we have. Right? All right. So getting back to the part of the article that we were at, clearly indicates India's debt is estimated to be 62% of GDP. This is only central government. There is around 30% more for the state governments. What about uh, the tax to GDP ratio? 11%, 10.8% of the GDP is paid through tax. Around 5, 5 crore taxpayers in the country, right? This is the status of our country, all right? So debt to GDP ratio is at 6.8% or 15 lakh crore. You should start knowing these amounts. Thank you, Singh. Thank you very much. Hi, Peace Lover. Good evening. All right. Looks like you all are well aware of uh, all these four terms, right? So very good. Uh, the four terms that we spoke of are, uh, uh, again, repeating this, revenue deficit, fiscal deficit, effective revenue deficit, and, uh, and, and uh, primary deficit. All of them are very important and indicative of uh, the way government is moving ahead in spending its money. Revenue. So first one is revenue deficit. In case, in case I have taken, um, if I have earned 10 rupees this year, only for this year, and I am able to spend 11 rupees only on this year, one rupee is my revenue deficit. One rupee is my revenue deficit. I would have earned something on my, uh, you know, previous ventures. If I have earned profit on my, uh, you know, ventures, and that profit is capital earnings. That 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 profit. That earning is capital earnings. Similarly, if I have earned uh, profits, bonus, or if I have sold my, uh, you know, properties, government properties, these are my capital earnings. Suppose if I have earned 5 rupees on my capital earnings, capital earnings, and capital spendings are rupees 3, uh, uh, rupees 6, say rupees, oh, all right, rupees 7, capital uh, expenditure is rupees 7. So there is a capital deficit here of rupees 2 right so revenue deficit was 1 rupee here but fiscal deficit will be rupees 2 and rupees 1 included that means rupees 3 fiscal deficit right if this is revenue deficit right right but in this 1 rupee of deficit that i have this is the expenditure this was the earning if uh, if if 40 passe of this i have used for capital creation capital creation not revenue creation on capital creation, then uh, my effective revenue deficit will be the amount that I have deficit minus 0.4. That means it will utilize only that amount. It will it will tell us what is the exact amount being used only for the uh, revenue expenditures and not for capital expenditures, right? So this is a very good indicator of if I am using my revenues for capital creation or revenue or or, or revenue creation, right? And uh, what is uh, primary deficit, right? So this, this is the one which talks about the uh, amount that we are using for loans, loan repayment. Very important, you should know all of them, very important. And, and we did have two questions in the main exam in examination for paper 3 related exactly on this, what we have been looking at for the last two days. And this can be quoted anytime in interviews, in main examination, question for pre-exam can be asked. So please focus on this part. Uh, bonus stripping. Right? This has been in use because the government is trying to ensure that uh, people do not try to evade taxes. What happens? A simple example of this is, uh, suppose I have got uh, uh, 
uh, hundred shares in a company. Hundred shares in a company, and uh, these shares I purchased for uh, say uh, ten rupees, ten rupees, and now the prices have risen to twenty five rupees. All right, prices have risen to twenty five rupees. Now, not everybody will be able to purchase the expensive shares. right so the government so the company says that fine we will be uh, we will be issuing bonus shares one is to one bonus or one is to two bonus that means for one share that i have i will i will be given one more share one more share or if for one share that i have i'll be giving i'll be given more two more shares i'll have total three shares in that case it can be anything one is 10 also how does the company decide this company actually wants more people to participate in purchase of their shares right so that uh, the more the retail participation is more amount they are able to capture this is one of the reasons why company issues bonus shares bonus does not mean free when they issue this the price the price was uh, uh, 25 rupees right and if they are issuing one extra share the price will be reduced by a uh, half simple as simple as that right so there is no profit in the exact run but you will see how there are tax benefits for people this is what i am going to explain to you very quickly right so what i had was 100 shares i am using an example again right a different example here i had 100 shares and right now they are rated at 10 rupee right the company said that they will issue a bonus one is to one right so the price of the share will get reduced by half it will become rupees 5 per share but the number of shares that i have will increase by 2 i will have 200 shares all right so at the end i my amount in the company remains same but still the price of the share has decreased more people can more new people can purchase it right not everybody will be afford to able to afford 10 rupees but people will be able to afford 5 rupees right so what companies would do now see now this is the catch here there is something called as short term short term capital gain and there's something called as long term capital gain if i have held these shares for up to a year up to a year then it is a short term capital gain whatever amount of gain that i have and the taxation is at different percentage i think 15% for long term capital gain if i have held the share for more than a year the uh, earnings will be taxed at 10% and for intraday that means you're selling it within a day right intraday trading the taxation levels are uh, different right its its calculation is also different right now what happens is that as the company divides the day the company divides the share into two parts issues a bonus share my shares become double the people some people investors usually the big ones they have uh, these 200 shares now right so what they do is that uh, uh, they so uh, effectively for a few days it does not show up on the stock market right the double of it it shows only 100 shares right and at the price reduced by half right at 5 rupees bonus shares will be given later in times to come with and in a short while so what these people do is that they sell this share at a loss it is how it is how it is reflected in the accounts book they sell these shares 100 shares at half the price at loss but you know what government has an important provisioning if you have if you have gained if you have gained money you will be taxed but if you have lost money this will come as an offset offset means if you have had a loss in future you can compensate this loss the taxation will be reduced in future if you earn or or if you have losses the taxation total taxation to be paid that will be reduced for you right so very easy when they when you know the loss is incurred by the person this loss they will reduce in the taxes but the reality is that this is not a loss for them in long term they will they will get 100 more shares at the same amount so uh, these people what they do is that when they get the next 100 shares they they you know they get dividend also for that because they are shareholders and so they get dividend profits also and they also you know uh, are able to ensure that they have some exemptions through uh, the offsetting of the losses so so smart so the government has said that i know we know this very well what you are trying to do here you are avoiding taxation right you are there is no there was no issue in your uh, you know um losses but you are avoiding taxation so government has said that we are going to include in anti avoidance that you cannot avoid this kind of taxation here for reit real Inves investment trusts or uh 
इंफ्रास्ट्रक्चर इन्वेस्टमेंट ट्रस्ट इफ यू डू वेन दी कंपनी स्प्लिट और वेन दी कंपनी इशूज बोनस शेयर इन दीज काइंड ऑफ कंपनीज यू विल नॉट बी एबल टू यू नो टेक प्रॉफिट लाइक यू नो Uh, like, like selling them immediately and you know getting the offsets you cannot do that this is what the company has government has told hope you understood this all right vakram says sir one question why government has failed in debt recovering by selling assets even lic ipo good one very good so um the the government had planned an effective uh, sale of 1.5 lakh crore of uh, uh, the assets divestment of assets but they have not been able to divest at all this 1.5 lakh crores hardly a divestment of 10000 crores has happened 10000 crores has happened and just few days back uh, you know the fertilizer company was divested so it led to around uh, you know 20 20000 crores around 20000 crores is what government divested out of uh, 1.5 lakh crore right we have a secretary in is officer for this complete job allocated for them and this is hardly 10% of the total uh, divestment that was planned for this year this divestment was the one was the one which was going to fund our projects see i had told you yesterday that if we are not able to earn remember the capital capital Uh, uh, expenditure and capital earnings expenditure and earnings these are earnings this is the capital earning for the government government needs these capital earnings so that it does not have to take loans government is selling its own assets so that it doesn't have to take loans this is the situation for our country but it still is doing it because if it takes loans it will have to pay interest also right so it says that we will take uh, we will sell our assets but they are not even able to sell assets if they are able to sell assets they will be able to utilize this again in many many ways not revenue generation but capital generation for the country right they have not been able to sell in fact uh, air india was a deal air india took it uh, uh, tata took it back but uh, very few deals that happened this year this is the reason government started new plans for example national monetization pipeline so government says okay if you don't want to purchase the asset at least take it on hire Four years higher, three years higher, five, ten years higher. So they say that if railway land is available, take this land, right? Build your assets. If if this was a brownfield assets, brownfield means it has already been created. We are not able to utilize it. You utilize it. Private sector utilizes it and share some revenue with us, right? The plan has been for six lakh crore, six lakh crore for uh, up to two thousand and twenty-five national monetization pipeline. This this scheme. is coterminous with national infrastructure pipeline nip please do not get confused i am telling but please do not get confused we have covered this but i will explain to you innumerable times the number of times that you want me to know government said that we need 100 lakh crore investment in infrastructure sector 100 lakh crore out of this the central government will give 39 lakh crore state 39 lakh crore and they will also have you know further investments from other sources 22 lakh crore 39 lakh crore by central government infrastructure investment and uh, in 39 lakh crore the government now says that we will start we have started a monetization pipeline the central government assets will be monetized they will be unused assets will be put to uh, uh, contracts short period contracts for example ports roads uh, energy pipelines uh, government hotels government stadiums right uh satellites all of them uh for a period of time and through this monetization of this asset they will be able to generate 6 lakh crore simple so uh, this is what government had planned this is an alternative to our plan to sell the assets got you you got it so uh, so this is the situation but uh, when we are lacking on this only this plan what about completion of uh, selling of these assets divestment government has planned divestment for bpcl for banks but and lot of things but but you know when the when you look at the uh, how the market envisages this how the market sees government's participation they say that if in case you have only done 10% of your work you were paid fully you were pa you paid uh, senior is officer would be paid 3 lakh rupees per month salary but when you have completed only 10% of your job would you be in the job or not no 
either you resign on moral grounds or the government should throw them out. The senior IS officer here in this case. 10% of divestment only completed according to the ambition. And if you have not done this, report card must be generated. Right? So, not only the divestment, I am talking of national monetization and a pipeline, a national infrastructure pipeline. We should question both of them. When we do not have capital, this will come in the next budget. You will see that we will have to take loans because private is not participating. Right? So, uh, Vakram, I hope I answered this question. All right. Uh, Puja says Gati Shakti, Somik says Green also. Uh, no, no, no. This is for Brownfield only, Somik. Brownfield, the assets which are lying unutilized. Right now it is for Brownfield projects which are unutilized. Asset already created. Government is not going to send, spend a single penny on this. Private can participate and they will share the revenue expenditures. Right? They will share the earnings, revenue earnings. Okay? All right. So, uh, all right. Moving ahead to... Uh, this part again. So, this is where the government uh, later said that you cannot avoid these kind of taxation. Sorry for this flexibility. If I am flexible, I know that you people are not less smart. You are also flexible with me. So, now getting back to the topic, uh, the government later said that you will, you cannot skip this. Anti-avoidance we will apply. So, this, these trusts, right, real estate investment trust, infrastructure investment trust. These are trusts which are formed in which some people can contribute in money and this money will be utilized for creation of infrastructure asset. Uh, okay. This is the background to it. And when this fund, this fund, if it is growing very well and if it is giving profits, if, if the owner of this fund, if they want to split it or give bonus issues, you give the bonus, but, but the people who own this, they cannot immediate, immediately sell it and say that it was a loss and offset their losses. This will not happen for infrastructure projects they will have to pay the requisite taxes okay hope you got this a little technical but thankfully we covered this i hope that you understood po this point and then we have a question from uh, from puja she says she is not able to understand revenue deficit puja revenue deficit is the simplest thing to understand because revenue deficit is simple if uh, let me explain it to you through this my income in this year, only this year, not from the last year, uh, you know, earnings from this year only was uh, say rupees 50. I earned rupees 50 this year in my salary, but I spent rupees 60 in expenditure. What did I expend on? I paid to the people who were working with me, right? I paid for my clothing expenses. I ensured that I go and watch a movie. And, you know, and I paid for my clothing. So, because of this, I spent more than what I earned. 10 rupees, my revenue deficit. I spent more than I earned. 10 rupees, my revenue deficit. On the other hand, if, if, then the next point comes, then what is capital uh, deficit? There's no term as capital deficit. But, there is, if, if uh, there have been capital expenditure, suppose, if I purchase a TV like this, so uh, suppose it, it, the whole, this TV, a vehicle, a home, these are capital assets. If I purchase this and the cost of the capital asset was rupees 100, purchase right? And I also had capital assets. I had invested somewhere. I earned profits right now. Those long-term investment, more than one, one year investments, I earned profits. And overall, the profits that I earn or if I had some assets previously and I sold them, those are my earnings, capital earnings. I earned 50 rupees over that. So, 50 rupees over those earnings, but I spent uh, 100 rupees. This is my capital losses, 50 rupees. This loss, 50, 50 rupees, the capital loss and the revenue deficit, the total becomes the fiscal deficit. And this fiscal deficit will be, how will the government able to, uh, you know, counter this? This this fiscal deficit will be able to hand will will be will be handled through government's borrowings borrowings they will borrow this money from the market internal external they will be able to release bonds in the market they will be selling their assets what uh, one of you Swamik, i think spoke of selling the assets for example selling this assets and uh, uh, selling air india selling other uh, psu and this is how they will be earn, earning the you know necessary 
uh, borrowing from the market right so this is uh, fiscal and primary fiscal deficit and revenue deficit data centers why are they in use because their location is shifting they're shifting from the advanced developed countries to a country like india why so because of not one factor multiple factors one of the factors is voluntary and the second one is necessitated now voluntary necessitated is the factor that means india is wanting them to shift to a country like ours so we want data supremacy we want data uh, uh, to be owned by us our data to be owned by us so the term for this is uh, uh, a privacy right supremacy and uh, uh, there is another very good word for this i will come up with this so this is what india has asked the companies to do google twitter right now facebook uh, all of them their data centers to be established in india right on the other hand many uh, companies do want to shift to a country like india you know why because of the issues of climate change so singapore has got data centers many data centers the country is in europe for example netherlands has got many many data centers right countries in the uh, cold regions also have got uh, canada has got many data centers so has usa these are the data centers where huge bulk bulk you know uh, hard drives are kept uh, billions and trillions of uh, terabytes would be kept in very very big ho homes and they would be energized they would be energized through conventional sources of energy conventional so what does it do it leads to coal generation it leads to um, greenhouse gases and this is one reason that these countries voluntarily want that these industries shift to developing countries if you want it fine you take it yeah the word is data localization data localization very important keyword here this cannot this word cannot be re replaced supremacy uh, privacy and data localization right data is the new oil right it has been shown in the economic survey as well the more data we have the more agile we become and our path becomes more serpentile it's fine but we become supreme with our own uh, you know data right so india wants data centers to shift to india but it has got its own cost right we have seen the cost cost is rising uh, demand for energy and conventional energy this is the reason that the developed countries also want them to shift to india the union budget granted infrastructure status to data data industry also what if infrastructure is granted to data center they will get more loans in a country like ours so what do we need we need cables undersea cables what are these cables these cables are uh, uh, the important cables uh, they are laid sub sub surface undersea cables called as submarine cables right and then we need cable landing stations now we have got few of them so those areas mumbai kolkata chennai right so these are some places which have already got uh, uh, these uh, submarine cables from the other countries laying from other countries right these long cables ensure that there, there is a complete transmission of data to us as well cannot we transmit them through satellites yes we can do that but this is another effective way through which it can, it has been done around the world cables are laid across the whole sea we need more of these uh, undersea cables and we need cable landing stations more of them right now we have got few of them we need more of them and this is where our uh, marine maritime boundaries will be uh, very very relevant right now the issues in having the indigenous data centers is land availability right same land availability but what do you put here plug and play plug and play model start this model right land banks we need these for this right so every problem has a solution think of it you would rise the rise of demand of these kind of data centers in only specific urban areas rise of demand of these data centers can be reflected through the energy requirements for these data centers energy requirement is very high and that is only being met at urban areas demand is high there also so very simple this is a skewed rise skewed rise of data centers or demand of data centers or energy for these data centers see the government of china has uh, you know imposed a crackdown on on the mining of cryptocurrencies not cryptocurrencies per se but mining you know why because during mining of cryptocurrencies right mining of uh, you know the data through cryptocurrencies it takes a huge lot of uh, energy 
energy and china is a it is not a uh, you know arctic country now most of the mining is carried out in those countries which are cooler or which have high availability of energy cooler cooler means uh, uh, those countries which are located above 60 degree latitude or the absolutely temperate areas canada norwegian countries these are the places where uh, uh, you know crypto mining is done why because here it is more efficient it is colder it keeps the whole data center and the complete uh, computer network architecture cooler. But in a place like China, since it is a little, you know, at the mid latitude area, it needs more energy. China cannot afford to spend this energy. And this energy is not even giving Chinese uh, the revenue, the government the revenue, CPC the revenue. So this is the reason that they have put a crackdown on this. Uh, they've had a crackdown on this, but uh, yeah. So this is the situation. Energy availability is one. Uh, issue here. See, IT load capacity for uh, you know these kind of data center architecture is only high in cities like Mumbai, Chennai, Bengaluru, Pune, Delhi, Hyderabad, Kolkata, and other cities. Why in these cities? Yeah, specifically located close to the coast. See? Okay. All right. So this is what it is. So important snapshots, and these are foundation articles. Very important news. You will not fall in trouble later. Okay, moving ahead to the next one, uh, this day in history dedicated to the first electric train. Have you heard ever heard the word DMU, diesel uh, multiple unit, right? And then we also have uh, EMU, have you heard of this word? Whenever you go to railway station, they say EMU arriving at platform number 5, electric locomotive unit, right? So, uh, these locomotive units, the the EMUs, they started on this day itself, February 3rd, 1925. Electric motive units are more powerful than the diesel locomotive units, right? Because electricity can be provided, uh, you know, and they can thrust the engine, move the whole, uh, you know, all the convoy of cars. This is the reason. And if you look, if you've been to Mumbai Pune region, this is the Western Ghats region. The train had to climb up a mountain and then also uh, come down the mountain. So this is the reason that there, there could be an engine in the beginning and there could be a couple of engines at the end pushing the whole train, right? So more electricity or energy is required. This is the reason that we started the electric uh, electric uh, locomotives and electric, uh, electric cars, engines, right? Uh, this initiated in Mumbai. And if you remember, the, do you remember the first time uh, the train ran? What was the year or day? Which was the place? Ran of course in Mumbai. But the year, what was that year? Do you remember? Please put it down. Feature news for today is on uh, uh, the theme of economic survey, viable strategy and agile approach. An important question getting generated through this. Definitely not only one, more than one, an insight to many, many things that the government is doing. I was amazed when I thought deeply about uh, you know, this question. I will discuss this question detail with you and also discuss this particular image, a very beautiful image on which I asked you all the question itself, right? So this is a part of the feature news immediately after this video, immediately after. Image of the day on Pandya period inscriptions, 9th century inscriptions. Now, uh, these inscriptions have been found in uh, uh, in Telangana region, in Tamil Nadu, yes, Tamil Nadu region. And uh, what I want you to know about any inscription is the prehistoric times, the proto-historic times and the historic times, right? Historic means what has been written in the history. What has been written down is historic. What is proto-historic is between prehistoric and historic. Then what is prehistoric? <laughs> this is the time when nothing has been written, right? People are only moving around, saving their lives, climbing hill or climbing atop a, a tree so that, you know, they can save themselves from uh, wild animals. So this is the prehistoric time, only survival driven. Proto-historic is the time between prehistoric and historic, right? So people started to write or document what was happening to them, but but uh, the uh, you know language the script was not uh, understood well or it was not clear it was not uniformized but when people have started to interpret the history this is through the historic times through the scripts right 
So 9th century, we had a well-laid script at many places around the whole world. You can see one of these scripts, right? These are the scripts They are speaking of uh, uh, the food being offered to the god, right? Early Pandya kings. So Cheras, Cholas and Pandyas, three important uh, stakeholders in the medieval times in the south would fight with each other. Cheras in the Kerala region, Cholas. Tanjavur is the capital and Pandya, Pandyas right below them, right? All powerful at their own places. Very, very rich culturally. Right? All right. So what's next? Yes, Hima. Great. Somic, absolutely. Hebu, 1853. 1853. What Hima has mentioned? Mumbai to Thane. Absolutely. Thank you. D-M-U-E-M-U, M-E-M-U. Good. Good, Somic. Thank you. Good, yeah. Very nice. So Ravi says data because of Winter Olympics, China advised not to mine cryptos because of Winter Olympics, because Winter Olympics is also taking in a lot of energy, right? Conventional energy and they don't want the pollution to happen during winter times, Olympics times. So and advice is very, very uh, you know, euphemistic word. Euphemistic means, you know, you are pointing them with not a blunt, but a very, very, you know, soft arrow. Advice China would never do. When it is so aggressive, wolf for diplomacy towards other countries, imagine what it would do to its own people. Crack down is the word. Crack down. Right? So, uh, this is the image of uh, Buddha Vanam project. Thank you, uh, Hima. Thank you very much. You are very diligent on all this. Great. Nagarjun Sagar, located uh, at uh, Krishna River. And this is where this, uh, you know, this whole project was instituted. And there, there are various parts of this project, right? So we have uh, Buddha Charit Vanam, Bodhisattva Park, Dhyan Vanam, Meditation Park, see? So Jakarta Park is the Bodhisattva Park. And then there is a place for dedicating major events of life of Gautam Buddha, Dhyan Vanam for meditation, then mini, miniature Stupa Park, Maha Stupa. Now, these places have been dedicated for uh, this specific activity, propo propagation of Buddhism culture is because we have found relics of Buddhism at this site and what you should revise quickly when you get back are three important things related to the Buddhist monuments. One is the stupa itself, the second one is viharas and the third one is kaityas. Right? So stupa is the place, this is like a stupa, this is the place where the relics or the you know important parts, body parts of important or important clothing, other entities of those people held high in regard, right? They were kept here so that we could pray toward, pray, you know, pray them. So we have stupas for Gautam Buddha at multiple places. His hair would be kept at places. His clothing would be kept at places. So this is stupa. The second one is um, uh, viharas and chaitya. Second one is chaitya. Chaitya is the place of worship, right? If you look at Elora, uh, uh, Elora caves, we find many Chaityas here, some Chaityas here. If you look at Karla and Bhaja caves, Karla Bhaja in Maharashtra, you would find Chaityas here, places of worship, right? And Viharas are the places where uh, the monks would reside, right? So they are emulating these kind of places through uh, the novel constructions, right? Nagarjun Sagar, this is where it is dedicated, right? Shiru. Uh, formation. Uh, this is another uh, mini lateral. You would like to call it like this. Countries, right? So uh, these are the you know away from the traditional associations, right? R Russia, China, and Iran. All these three countries considered as a defiant at their own ways. So Iran defiant in the subcontinent continent region. Russia defiant in European region, and China defiant in Asian East Asian or Asian region. All these three countries have formed an association. Imagine this. They are, con <laughs> they are conducting naval exercises. Shiru. Uh, around the Middle East region. Right? So something for concern. I don't know. Alright. They want to expand their economy. But uh, this, you know, military exercises. They are little intimidating to smaller countries. Africa is very much vulnerable. And uh, so are places in, in the Gulf. But see, Gulf is also divided. It is not united. Because... Uh, uh, Saudi is the head, but then we have Israel as well. And if and what about uh, countries like uh, um, UAE? Uh, uh, you know they are uh, they are you know they are not 
you know they are not very much obedient to uh, sorry all the time indian environment services now we have a service called as indian forest service ifos oh this reminds me of the notification do you people know that the notification for upsc exam has released notification has come up and the pre exam has been scheduled for 5 june 2022 prelims exam yeah and then uh, when what is the last date the last date for uh, filling up this form is i think 22nd of uh, feb itself 22nd of feb so fill it up sooner than later take a week we will also introduce a couple of videos how to fill up this form right so 5 june note this date this is a sunday this is the day exam is going to get held and then in september we have the main exam scheduled right so june july august september you have around 3 months for the uh, for the main exam preparation see they are trying to regularize the old schedule not disturbed by corona pandemic so this is this becomes important for you important input right all the other things remaining you know same the uh, and they have increased a few number of seats so happy news but around 800 only all right so uh, what is the context of indian uh, environment service this is in news because uh, there was a proposal to introduce a service called as indian environment service now we have had indian forest service we have had indian administrative service indian police service right but they, we have not had an indian environment service when we are when we have a ministry for environment forest and climate change so you know we have forest service officers what about the environment service officers we don't have them there was a proposal in the tsr subramaniam committee report that we must have an environment service as well if you have noted noted down at the right place you should note this down at the place where we where we said that the district environment impact assessment committee it has uh, it has conflict of interest right the central government initiating a norm saying that if uh, if you you know the number of days to clear these environment projects if this is short we will rate you high in uh, ease of doing business then you should speak about independent officers indian environment services officers this is why it is in news supreme court also sought center's response what are you doing to initiate this indian environment service all right so this is why in news this is the context i gave you the context why you should look at this environment service right and they will help in you know having an umbrella law under which all the forest laws and environment laws will be there right protected areas with 70% of tree cover all this all right brain mimicking chip why is this in news 861 vacancies great all the best to you you people are just around 40 50 of you that i know that you people are uh, part of right so 50 out of 861 no big deal you will have one seat each for yourself right all right great netra ravi you people are all updated with this great pooja iranian okay uh, brain making making chip right so uh, brain making chip is uh, a chip that they they are going to you know form uh, this is the research and development which will mimic the brain when artificial intelligence is created it ideally works on one and zero one and zero either it is yes or it is no but the brain doesn't work on one and zero brain works on uh, uh, you know uh, the number or the frequency of the uh, neural uh, you know electrons that that they work it it works in a progressive manner right so when it works in a progressive manner we cannot only have zero and one it must be analog in nature our brain so if we have a chip which understands analogous nature of uh, the brain then we will have artificial intelligence which will be more creative it will be more progressive it will be faster than what is happening right now this will be called as neuromorphic will it raise concerns for ethics maybe probably totally depends on the kind of project that we are uh, going to run right so for this one will have to study how brain actually works neuromorphic computing right so digital chips read ones and zeros and analog chips can decipher incremental information in sound waves incremental information right so this is how the brain maps activities more electronic signals and then we will be you know uh, spurred to do something it is not that if we receive one and then we do something we receive zero we do something else right aisa nahi hai ki ek bola to we start eating food and zero bola to we go to sleep right it is a progressive incremental information that the brain receives if we are able to map this a chip uh, on a chip then we will have uh, a, a different kind of 
you know more energy efficient algorithms for artificial intelligence artificial intelligence is nothing but a brain right okay somek says tsr subramanyam former cabinet secretary his recommendation for indian education service indian uh, as a part of ips all right see we have an education service in the state government somek we have an education service in the state government in education department it is education largely is a subject that deals with the state governments no that is the reason that we already have it i uh, mean while let me ask you who is the four, who is the chairman cha who was the chairperson of 14 finance commission 13 to 9 2013 to 2017 all right now oh here we are state level elementary education here we go the article related to what you just spoke of right so uh, this is about multiple levels of checks and hierarchies in uh, education architecture in the state right if the teachers have to be trained what is the kind of syllabus if there are multiple levels of hierarchy then there is no uniformity and also not only a particular state uniformity for example haryana or himachal we also look at interstate disparity i would like to give my example itself although i did not study at state boards but i studied in icsc and cbsc boards and it was not a change from you know for just one year i studied in six schools and i my 12th was from cbsc my 10th was from icsc my 8th was from cbsc my 6th was from uh, icsc my 4th was from cbsc and my 2nd was from icsc imagine this and i not only understood the curriculum of both the uh, courses but i also saw the differences in courses they would so for example one book the same book julius caesar would be taught in class 8 9th and 10th in english syllabus in icsc boards and in, 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 when i joined this in class 9th i saw the gap in my education there should be uniformity there must be uniformity of examination conduction syllabus writing of the whole books at all the states level interstate and intrastate right so at present there is a variation in the extent of integration among administrative bodies overseeing school administration at state level right so the scert state uh, council of educational research and training in himachal pradesh teachers are subjected to multiple training modules right and if if there is uh, you know the difference in multiple training modules are there then you know they would be receiving different training different education at different places there will be complete chaos right this is what the first editorial talks of and when specifically national education policy 2022 guarantees blended education it guarantees uh, 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 academic bank of credits for higher education not children level but higher education so we all the more need more robust teachers but we need some policy which are underlying and cemented rock cemented right the second editorial for today is on artificial intelligence technologies have uh, impacting the climate change see we might think start relating it to the ethics of artificial intelligence or climate change as well and the domination over artificial intelligence i really love this article this article spoke about the kind of um, uh, exposure differentiated exposure developed countries have over developing countries as far as artificial intelligence is considered so when they have more exposure we will be subjected to what they have what knowledge they have but they neither reveal the knowledge nor they talk about the side effects of these knowledge right for example can you imagine the kind of energy that is consumed for artificial intelligence project for example data centers only right locating them or relocating them at uh, any place it, it contributes to climate change this is the reason many countries are voluntarily shifting this to other countries china netherlands singapore canada artificial intelligence side impacts right and there is an ethical debate around what is the level of uh, doing this related to the neural uh, you know imaging that i just spoke of right it has footprints on the climate right so this is where the the developing countries must assess what is the level to which they would like to use artificial intelligence remember one more thing that i had mentioned horizontal expansion is better than a vertical expansion because in vertical expansion we will lead to specialities there will be reduction in jobs but in horizontal expansion we will lead to diversification of the kind of jobs right increasing the kind of innovations so more technology more innovations and more jobs creation but if we have specialization only in few fields jobs will get further reduced for people 
for a country like india we cannot afford this right so lot of side effects of the artificial intelligence technology is not shared by developed world with the developing world this is an important part of the uh, artificial intelligence of the modern world all right if you like this initiative share some love through likes comments and shares right because through this we will uh, get better so this liking this initiative is very very important case study for today is on roti bank right during these times of pandemic uh, if people are doing small acts of uh, valor through helping other uh, this is effect this is affected and reflected through the roti bank right so kolkata based but at various parts of the country they have started this they have fed more than 15000 people as of now not daily but yes see this is a small prerogative if you are feeding 200 people 150 people only per day which they are doing right all free of cost this is amazing this is the kind of service that people require right they cater to orphanages orphanages they cater to those people who are underprivileged right so packaging of food as well uh, and distributing it to people right they also uh, deal with women development activities for example distribution of sanitary pads vocational training self defenses for more than 1000 women this is what they have participated in so if you do this at community level right so this is going to improve for the whole country once my mentor had shared with me if we clean the veranda of our own homes if we clean the veranda of our own homes and everybody do does this we will not need a such bharat abhiyan everybody cleaning their home front and a few people like them uh, roti roti bank they helping others who are deprived or not able to do this great initiative this is what the government also is trying and we need people we need people who can do well people like you who can do well one deed of kindness noticed is worthy 40 that are told one deed of kindness noticed or done is worthy 40 that they are, that are told that means in case of you for now how it reflects is you must not say i will do this i will do answer writing no you must not tell this 40 deeds of telling answer writing and one deed of writing answer <laughs> one deed of writing answer is far more you know kinder than 40 times telling that you will write an answer you are you guys are reaching a stage where you should start answering questions all right so, because now you have achieved a level, I can see that in your writings, that you have started writing point wise, you have started elaborating your points, you have started giving examples. So, yes, practicing is more important. Look at your optional paper, look at all the GS4 papers, start looking at essay paper, right? And there is around, uh, what, four months time, around four months time to the pre-exam. So, allocate some time to pre-exam and continue the preparation that you are doing all the while, right? Start meeting uh, people in this community, start speaking to each other. We will see you in the feature news in a short while. Questions, please post them here. So, Sam says, Elon Musk's neural links, all right? IPR, Hima, okay. Why we ready, Netra? Hima, Vakram, absolutely. Good, thank you. Uh, Somik, yes, education is current and current list. I think so. Absolutely. So, good. We will meet you in the feature news in a very, very short while, right? See you. Thank you for participating. Share some love through likes, comments and shares. Questions, please post them down.